study in First Kings, but we got to turn to First Chronicles tonight. So, First Chronicles and the very last two chapters, chapter twenty-eight and twenty-nine, <clears throat> and once again, Chronicles and Kings and Samuel, Samuel and Kings, and then the Chronicles are kind of like the Gospels. You got the same story. Uh, you've got it repeated in some aspects, but uh, what's what's interesting is is that uh, you you can't have the whole story unless you put it all together, and so it's the it's kind of similar, like I say, to the Gospels. Now we ended First Kings chapter two with the death of David, but we're gonna we're gonna go to Chronicles now, and it's gonna tell us what happened before he died. We also ended. 1 Kings 2, well, actually in 1 Kings 1, in 1 Kings chapter 1, we see uh, Solomon's brother, and he's going to declare himself to be king, and in haste, Bathsheba and Nathan come to David, and they're like, hey, isn't Solomon supposed to be king? Yes, take my mule, put him on him, run him through the streets, and so they have this massive cheer goes out, it's so loud that, that the other guys hear it, And they realize that they have made Solomon king. But we're going to make Solomon king again. And so uh, in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, uh, we're we're going to find out that there's there's more to the coronation. All right. And so in verse 1, it says, And David assembled all the princes of Israel, the princes of the tribes, and the captains of the companies that ministered to the king by course, the captains over the thousands, the captains over the hundreds, and the stewards over all the substance and possession of the king and of his sons, with the officers and with the mighty men, with all the valiant men unto Jerusalem. So this summons takes some time. Okay, So in Kings we read about, boom, they make Solomon king immediately. And the people that are there, they rejoice. But then this summons goes out, and David gathers all these people together. So they're going to have a proper... Uh, coronation and he says in verse 2 then David the king stood up upon his feet and said hear me my brethren and my people as for me I had in mine heart to build an house for rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and had made ready for the building so so David says I had it in my heart this is something that I wanted to do and you remember we we read about that in second Samuel he says hey I want to do this and and Nathan's like, man, that sounds like a great idea. You know, go get after it. And then God comes to Nathan and says, no, 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 no. This, David's not going to do this. So he has to come back to him and say, eh, God says you're not supposed to do this. So David says, I had this in my heart. There's something I wanted to do. And it's just a great reminder that sometimes we, uh, sometimes we have something in our heart and God says, no, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you make preparation for it or... I'm going to have you do something else. And, and so, so he's going to put a stop to this, all right, as far as David building this building. Verse 3, But God said unto me, Thou shalt not build a house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war and hast shed blood. Now, that's interesting. Um, you know, we, we read of, of David and his military exploits all throughout First and Second Samuel, uh, but God, God uses this. This is, this is part of the reason why God says, no, you're not going to be the one. How be it? Verse 4. The Lord God of Israel chose me. And, and, and look at that, that word chose. Because we're going to see this quite a bit in the next few verses. <clears throat> How be it? The Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. So out of all of David's brothers, God chooses him. He says, uh, uh, for he hath chosen Judah to be the ruler out of all the tribes of Israel. God chose Judah. And of the house of Judah, the house of my father, and among the sons of my father, he liked me to make me king over all Israel. So this is, this is God's choosing. And of all my sons, for the Lord hath given me many sons, he hath chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. And he said unto me, Solomon thy son, he shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father." If you go back, and, and we're not going to do it because of time, but if you go back and read uh, the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7, you'll see that he makes mention of David's son, 
And if David's son will follow him, then he'll be blessed. But if David's son rejects him, then he's going to discipline him. And so he tells us here that God is talking about Solomon specifically out of all of his sons. Okay. And so he says there, verse 7, Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever, if he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments as at this day. Now, therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord, and in the audience of our God, keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God, that ye may possess this good land, and leave it for an inheritance for your children after you forever. And so this is David's charge to Solomon. God chose Judah out of Judah. God chose Jesse's family out of Jesse's family. God chose David out of David's sons, which he has many. God chose Solomon to be the next king. God also chose Solomon to be the one to build the temple. Now, what we have here is, is this is, and we see this all throughout the Bible, this is God's election. This is election. God does the choosing. Now, the the interesting thing about this to me is, is even though Solomon's going to be the one to, we're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about God's plan. And so God says, I I choose David to be king, but that doesn't mean that I reject the entire nation. No, no, no. He's going to lead. I choose Judah for the kingdom, but that doesn't mean I reject the other tribes. No, no, no. But they are to submit to the king that God chooses. They are to submit to the leadership of the king that God chooses after David. Okay, And so if you take that same mentality and bring that to the New Testament, you, you continue to see that God has done this. He's done this throughout time. God chose Abraham. Abraham has two sons. He doesn't choose Ishmael. God chooses Isaac. The covenant goes through Isaac. God chooses Isaac's sons. He doesn't choose Esau. He chooses Jacob. And, and we see that continued here. And so when we come to the New Testament, we learn that God says anyone can be saved, but there's only one way, and that's through the man that I choose, and that's Jesus. So Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so, so we, we, we see this laid out for us here. And he's going to go on, and verse 9 he says, And now Solomon, my son, Know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee, but if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. And so so he's, he's challenging Solomon to continue to follow the Lord. He says, God knows your heart. And and, you know, as a, as a human being, just not being a king or a leader or anything like just as, as a human being, that is one of the most comforting things, and it's also one of the most terrifying things. Uh, God knows the thoughts of my heart. God knows the imaginations of my heart. Um, the only way that you can know what's going on in my heart is if I choose to allow you to by opening my mouth and telling you uh, what's going on in my heart, right? But, but God, He knows. And He's reminding Solomon of this. Take heed now, verse 10. For the Lord hath chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. So, so very similar to what we saw in 1 Kings. Be a man. Be courageous. Be strong. Do what God's called you to do. Okay? Verse 11. <clears throat> this is really, really interesting too. So, so not only does God do the choosing as to who the king is going to be, and does God do the choosing of of who's going to build the house for worship, but he's also going to not leave that up to Solomon's imagination, okay? God is going to give the the pattern and the plan for the construction. Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and of the houses thereof and of the treasuries thereof and of the upper chambers thereof and of the inner parlors thereof and of the place of the mercy seat and the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord and of all the chambers round about and the treasuries of the house of God and of the treasuries of the dedicated things, also for the courses of the priests and the Levites and for all the work of the service of the house of the Lord and for all the vessels of service in the house of the Lord. He gave of gold by weight for things of gold, for all instruments of all manner of service, silver also for all instruments of silver by weight, for all instruments of every kind of service, even the weight for the candlesticks of gold, for their lamps of gold by weight for every candlestick, and for the lamps thereof, and for the candlesticks of silver by weight, 
both for the candlestick and also for the lamps thereof, according to the use of every candlestick. And by weight he gave gold for the tables of showbread, for every table, and likewise silver for the tables of silver. Now this is, this is fascinating to me because what he's saying is, is God gave the pattern. God told David, you, you had this in your heart to build this, but you're not going to do it because you are a, a man of bloodshed. But here's the pattern. It's to be this long, this high, this wide. What's that remind you of? Okay, it, it reminds you of, of the pattern given to uh, in Exodus to Moses, right? Uh, Moses was not left to creativity. Hey, Moses, build this this fancy house, to this tent to worship God and do it however you want. No, 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 no. It'll be made out of these materials and it'll be this big and this long and this will be this big and this long. It reminds you of Noah. Hey, Noah. Build me this boat. It's going to be this long, this high, this wide. You know, and so so what we see here is, is we see that worship of God is not left up to man's creativity. Not entirely. Maybe partially. But even, and, and he goes through here meticulously, the weight of the gold in the candlesticks was given to David. You make these candlesticks out of gold and they need to weigh this much. And you make these candlesticks out of silver and they need to weigh this much. He goes on and says, verse 16, By weight he gave gold for the tables of showbread for every table, and likewise silver for the tables of silver, also pure gold for the flesh hooks, and the bowls and the cups and for the golden basins he gave gold by weight for every basin and likewise silver by weight for every basin of silver and for the altar of incense refined gold by weight and gold for the pattern of the chariot of the cherubims that spread out their wings and covered the ark of the covenant of the Lord. All this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me, even all the works of this pattern. So we saw in, uh, I believe at the end of 2 Samuel, that David understood that God had inspired him to write the things that he had written uh, uh, in the Word of God. We also see that the pattern for the, the temple is inspired by God. It was not left up to David's ideology. So David didn't go measure a pagan temple. And build it like that. And David didn't go and figure out the golden mean from the the Romans, or they weren't even around yet. But but uh, the Assyrians. Now we're going to see that there's a king in Israel, and he's going to go and he's going to see a pagan altar, and he's going to be so impressed with it, he's going to come back, he's going to build one in like in, in Samaria. But God made sure that that didn't happen. There's no. Uh, no part of this that God doesn't tell him, look, this is the pattern, this is how you build it. But you got to hand this down to Solomon because he's going to be the one to build it. Now that's interesting to me. There's a couple of things I see here. One is, is, is just like we said about coming to Jesus in faith. You know, there, there's only one way to God. Only one. You, you come to God through Jesus. The Jews don't get saved some other way. Uh, the Muslims don't get saved some other way. Uh, um, some cult doesn't get saved some other way. There's only one way to come to God. And it's by His prescription. Okay, By His direction. The pattern for uh, um, what, we, what we have as far as worship is given to us by God. Okay, Not only that, but this pattern is to be handed down. And so God gives it to David, but then David, he hands this down. And we see this with Adam in the garden. God tells Adam some things. He's supposed to hand that down to the next generation. God tells Noah some things. He's supposed to hand that down to the next generation. God gives Moses some things. He's supposed to hand them down. And he does the same with us. We're supposed to hand down the faith to the next generation. And that's what, that's what David was, was doing here. And he's doing it in a very public way as he's giving this charge to Solomon. And that's, uh, that's what he says right here in verse 20. Let's stop for one second. Let's go back. Let me just show you something real interesting. If you want to turn to 2 Samuel 22 and, uh, and, then, and, I want, and compare something here. <clears throat> it says there, and it, it, it kind of it strikes you as you read it, there in 1 Chronicles 28, 18. It says, For the altar of incense refined gold by weight, and gold for the pattern of the chariot 
of the cherubims. Now, that can't mean, well, where are the cherubims? Well, there's, there's, there's two sets. There's one set that are hammered into the top of the mercy seat, right? Then there's another set that are going to be built in this temple, and they're going to be these huge ones that are going to stand either side of the, the curtain in the Holy of Holies, okay? But it can't be for a chariot to move them around because this temple is not going to be moved anymore. This isn't like the tabernacle. And it couldn't have been a chariot to move them then anyway because how are you supposed to move the ark? Carry it on the staves, right? So what is the chariot of the cherubims? Well, that's God's chariot. That's what the mercy seat represents. It, it represents God's throne on this earth, but God's throne is mobile. And in 2 Samuel 22 and <clears throat> verse 10 in this psalm, which is also, I believe, Psalm 18, it's talking about God and it says, He bowed the heavens also and He came down and darkness was under His feet and He rode upon a cherub and did fly. So the, the, the cherubims are this, this category of what we're going to call angels. Uh, what I'm going to call angels. I don't know if, if they fit into that category. There's some kind of uh, living creatures. Uh, we, we see them in Revelation uh, when we see the throne room of heaven. We also see them in the book of Ezekiel. And we see very clearly in Ezekiel that the cherubim are directly related in the wheels within wheels that Ezekiel sees as God's throne moves about and flies around. So in your mind, when you picture God being on a cherub and flying, do not picture him surfing on top of a little fat angel baby, okay? That, that's not what's happening. It is, it is the, the, the fact that the representation of the mercy seat is literally a, a, the only prescribed visual representation of God's chariot uh, at, that, that's on top of the Ark of the Covenant, all right? By the way, isn't it interesting? The Israelites are not allowed to make any form of graven image of anything in heaven or earth anywhere except this. And they're instructed, Bezalel and Ahalehab were instructed specifically to make out of one piece of hammered gold the Ark of the Covenant's lid, which has creatures beaten into it. That's strange. But once again, was it man's idea? Did man dream this up and say, ooh, I'm going to make this image and put it in there to worship God? No. And they didn't bow down to this image. They offered the blood on top of the mercy seat there. But God himself is never represented inside of the Holy of Holies. So it's his chariot, he tells us there. The pattern of the chariot of the cherubims. So I'm thinking that instead of horses pulling God's chariot, or maybe there's horses too, but there's also these flying cherubim. Anyway, let's go on. He says there in uh, uh, verse 20, And David said to Solomon, back to 1 Chronicles chapter 28, And David said to Solomon his son, Be strong and of good courage, and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. And that sounds a lot like the charge given to Joshua. Be strong and of a good courage. Uh, he, he encourages Solomon in, in verse 10 and again here in verse 20. And he says, do it. I'm giving you this charge. I'm giving you this instruction. I'm giving you this pattern. Now do it. Put it into practice. Don't be dismayed. Uh, the work is going to be, it's a, it's a big task. There's a lot to it, but God's going to, he's going to help you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. Verse 21, and behold, the courses of the priests and the Levites, even they shall be with thee for all the service of the house of God. And so, so this is a national charge to the whole nation. And he's, he's telling Solomon, you're going to, you're going to lead out in this, but these guys are going to help you. And there shall be with thee for all manner of workmanship, every willing, skillful man. Guys like Bezalel and Aholihab, that, 
that were gifted by God during the time of Moses to do the work that was there. He says, the skillful men here within Israel, they're going to help you for any manner of service, any of the things that need to be done. Also the princes and all the people will be holy at thy commandment. Well, he's the king, but, but David is kind of reminding him. It's kind of interesting. This is, this is the old king going out, new king coming in, old king saying, y'all do what he says and he's going to do what God says. And that's what real leadership is all about, is pointing people to following the Lord. Okay. Furthermore, David the king, chapter 29, verse 1, said unto all the congregation, Solomon my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great. For the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now, now what he's saying here is, is this this is a great work it's it's a it's a colossal building and there's an awful lot to it but it's more than just building a building this is the temple and so uh, this needs to be approached with reverence and fear and and in faith and and you know we're 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 doing we're doing something here that that God's instructed us to build now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God the gold for things to be made of gold, and the silver for things of silver, and the brass for things of brass, the iron for things of iron, and wood for things of wood, onyx stones and stones to be set, glistering stones and of divers colors, and all manner of precious stones and marble stones in abundance. So David in his life had, had acquired much wealth as king, and he's saying, I am leading out in setting these things aside for the construction of this temple and all of these different things okay and uh, it's it's a great reminder uh, once again of what leadership is leadership is leading from the front and so unlike some of our leaders today who constantly tax the people and make themselves rich David is saying I have I have made available all kinds of this Gold, silver, iron, brass, wood, precious stones. I mean, this is, this is huge. You, you remember, he traded some cities to a guy, to his buddy Hiram from Tyre, to fell trees in Lebanon. They didn't have the trees necessary for the building of this in Israel. So they had to fell them in Lebanon, float them down the coast, and then carry them across to Jerusalem. And so he's got this pile of cedar logs sitting over there that it's taken... Well, he had to trade cities for them. It's taken thousands and thousands of man hours to get all of this done. So he's got all of this stuff stacked around. David's been doing this for years and years. Okay, And he goes on in verse 3 and he says, Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have of mine own proper good of gold and silver. Of my own. I'm not taken from the coffers of the nation to do this. This is my own which I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. So so over and above. And once again, we remember when David bought the threshing floor of Arunah, Ornan, that Ornan would have gladly given it to David. And he offered, I'll give you the oxen for the sacrifice. I'll give you the threshing floor for the, for the altar place. I'll give you the wood for the fire. I'll give you the rocks to make the altar. I'll give it all to you. And David said, I will not offer to my God a sacrifice that costs me nothing. And so here we see in this chapter, we're going to see the heart of King David. And we're going to see the heart of the people. And and it's a, an encouragement to all of us that <clears throat> chapter 28 is all about worshiping God on His terms. Coming to God in the way that He says you're to come to God. This chapter is all about worshiping God with all of your heart and being willing to give to the service and to the work of the Lord. So verse 4 says, Even 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver, to overlay the walls of the house with all. Now, I mean, this is astronomical price. The gold for things of gold, the silver for things of silver, and for all manner of work to be made by the hands of artificers. And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? And so David says, I've led out in this. I have have made available all these materials and all this. 
Now, <clears throat> he's asking the people, who's going to help? Who's going to give for the service of the Lord? You know, there's, there's, there's several different ways you can give to the Lord. One of the ways is, is monetarily. So David says, I've done. I'm old. I'm not going to get to help build this thing. God says I can't help build it. But I have made the preparations for it. And it was very costly. But who's going to help with service? Who's going to help with work? Who's going to help with all of these kind of things, right? Verse 6. Then the chief of the fathers and the princes of the tribes of Israel and the captains of thousands and of hundreds and of the rulers of the king's work offered willingly. You're going to see that word. In the last one you saw chosen, chosen, chosen. In this chapter you're going to see willful, willingly, willingly. Okay? He says they offered willingly. This is not compulsory. He did not go to the governors, the heads of the tribes and say, you must give thus and such. No, no, no. They, they, he just asked, who, who wants to help with this? Verse 7, And gave for the service of the house of gold of God gold 5,000 talents and 10,000 drams, and of silver 10,000 talents, and of brass 18,000 talents, and 100,000 talents of iron. And they with whom precious stones were found gave them to the treasure of the house of the Lord by the hand of Jehiel the Gishronite. Then the people rejoiced, for that they offered, and there it is, willingly, because with a perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. And it is, it is, it is a joyful thing when you see people offer willingly to the work of God. They offer their service, their talent, their time, their treasure, all of these different things. And so they are just rejoicing. Verse 10, Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. And that sounds an awful lot like the ending of the Lord's Prayer, doesn't it? Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And, and, but, but look what he says there. He, he, says, he says, it's all yours, Lord, thine. It's your kingdom. He says, both riches and honor come of thee. How did we get rich? How did we make this gold? How did we make this silver? Well, you, you gave it to us, Lord. It, it all came from you. And thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might. And in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. The Israelite people were the beneficiaries of God's goodness, of God's strength, of God's power. Some of this gold and silver and, and, and whatnot had come to them through the spoils of war. They had conquered their enemies. They had taken their spoils. Some of it they dug out of the hills. Israel's rich in some of these, these precious minerals and, and gemstones and that sort of thing. Uh, some of it they had made through their agriculture ventures and through their mining expeditions and through all of these different, different uh, uh, businesses that they had. Okay? But he acknowledges, every bit of it comes from you. You have given us all of this and you've given us strength to get this wealth. Verse 13, Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Verse 14, but who am I? This is exactly the same thing that David says when God says that he's going to make him king and he's going to promise him an everlasting covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Who am I? Why me, Lord? I don't, it's, 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 not, it's not because I'm such a great person. It's not because I'm, you know, any of these things. It's, it's because of you. And so he says, but who am I and what is my people? that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort. For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. Oh boy. <laughs> so if you just take and you put that into perspective today, what you've got to realize is, is when it comes to giving an offering to God, it's not about how much you give, but to how much you give back. Because everything that we have comes from God. Now, I don't think that, that you know, I don't think that everybody believes that. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's lots of people who are really proud of what they have, and they think that they've gotten it for themselves. But, but all throughout God's Word, he is, He's very clear 
And if you just think about it for just a little bit, you know, if you have a smart mind, where did that come from? You say, my parents. Well, I, I suppose, <laughs> I suppose, that, you know, they passed on some genetic traits to you, but, but it came from God. If you have a strong back, where did it come? It came from God. If you have skill to, to do so, it came from God. If you have opportunities for your business to do good, it came from God. If you have an inheritance that's handed down to you, it came from God. All of these things come from the Lord. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, the New Testament says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And so nothing has changed. Old Testament, New Testament, God loves a cheerful giver. God loves this day as he sees the people willingly give to the work of the temple. And as David is praising God and blessing God, he reminds himself, everybody there, and he cries out to the Lord and he says, All things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. For we are strangers before thee and sojourners. As were all our fathers, our days on earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. We're just here for a little while. Our days are like a shadow. O Lord our God, all the store that we have prepared to build thee in house for thine holy name cometh of thine hand, and is all thine own. We're just, we're, you've given it to us, we're giving it back to you, Lord, and we want to bless you in doing so. I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart, and hast pleasure in uprightness. So once again, he all of this, these two chapters, David's talking about his heart. He's talking to Solomon. Keep your heart right with God. God searches the heart. Uh, you have pleasure in an upright heart. As for me, in the uprightness of mine heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And now have I seen with joy thy people, which are present here, to offer willingly unto thee. And this does the king good. He, you know, selfishness is ugly. From, from the little bitty guys playing with toys on the floor to the, the old guys trying to make sure that they don't, uh, uh, you know, they squeeze the grease out of the very last penny that they made. Uh, uh, ugliness, uh, selfishness is always ugly. But generosity and willingly wor worshiping and giving to God is beautiful and it's joyful. Verse 18, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their heart unto thee. David says, from this day on, I don't want the Israelite people to ever forget this. I mean, here we are 3,000 years later reading about this. And, and it does in our hearts something good as well. Worship. Worship costs us. It, it costs us to worship God. It does. It costs us time. It costs us energy. It costs us, us money. Uh, they're going to offer sacrifices. These animals cost money. They're giving this these precious metals and all of these things. But it is a blessing to be able to do this. And it comes from the heart. And that's what God wants. What God wants from us when we give is He wants for us to give from the heart. He wants for us to, to prayerfully give, to willingly give, to cheerfully give. And so he says, I want for generations to remember this day <clears throat> uh, uh, in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their heart unto thee. And give unto Solomon my son a perfect heart to keep thy commandments, thy testimonies, thy statutes, and to do all these things and to build the palace for the which I have made provision. And David said to all the congregation, Now bless the Lord your God. Isn't it interesting? They, they never ask God to bless them. As a matter of fact, David is kind of saying in that, that earlier part, God, you've already blessed us. Now, now we want to we wanna bless you. Um, I, there's, a, there's a worship song. It's, it's called America, Bless God. You know, we, we've got the one that's God Bless America, and that's a good song too, and we need his blessing, and we ask for his blessing, but we need to bless the Lord as well. So he says to the congregation, Now bless the Lord your God, and all the congregation. Bless the Lord God of their fathers and bowed down their heads and worshiped the Lord and the King. And they sacrificed sacrifices unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings unto the Lord. On the morrow after that day, even a thousand bullocks, a thousand rams, and a thousand lambs with their drink offerings and sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. Wow! What a bloody work man work work that is an awful lot of work 
that took a lot of time. And we're going to see that they actually, we'll see this in the next few weeks, they're actually going to have to consecrate a bigger area because they can't butcher all the animals they have to to sacrifice. And it says, And they did eat and drink before the Lord on that day with great gladness. What a day. They are so excited. We, we, have, we have the blessing of God on our lives. We're going to build this temple to worship God. Uh, it's going to be, even though, even though, think about it, even though it's, it's built in one specific location on the threshing floor of our new Ar- Aruna in Jerusalem, in the particular spot that it's supposed to be built on, it's going to be a house of prayer for all nations. And God intends for anyone all over the planet to be able to come and to worship Him in that particular place. So they're rejoicing. And uh, they, they had great gladness. And they made Solomon the son of David king the second time. So you see there in 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 38 to 40, they make him king the first time. They do it in haste. They parade him through the streets of Jerusalem. They declare him to be king. And hurrah, everybody, you know, uh, God saved the king. But this time, David summons the entire nation together, all the leadership. And David talks about all the provision for the temple and, and makes a huge deal about it. It's going to last for several days. And they made him the king the second time and anointed him unto the Lord to be the chief governor and Zadok to be priest. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the... Oh, once again, there's another election of God. He rejected Abiathar. Solomon said, you go for your people and you stay there and you don't come back. And he chose Zadok. And so now the, the priesthood is going to go through Zadok. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David, his father, and prospered. And all Israel obeyed him. And as I said, they overlap a little bit. We don't know exactly how much. But we see very clearly that David is still alive while Solomon is made king. So unless he died that afternoon, their, their reigns overlap by days, weeks, months. We just don't, we just don't know. And, uh, <clears throat> and it says, uh, and, and they prospered and all Israel obeyed him. And all the princes and all the mighty men and all the sons likewise of King David submitted themselves unto Solomon the king. And the Lord magnified Solomon exceedingly in the sight of all Israel. And bestowed upon him such royal majesty as had not been on any king before him in Israel. So the the royal majesty of Solomon, the, the, the wealth, the power, the elevation, the pomp, the circumstance, um, it's going to be more, more than it was with David. Um, and, uh, you know, if you think about David, David is more of the fighting general who becomes the king Solomon is the young man who becomes king, who's kind of sort of been groomed to be king his whole life. And so so you're going to see some differences there. Verse 26, Thus David the son of Jesse reigned over all Israel. And the time that he reigned over Israel was 40 years. Seven years reigned he in Hebron, and 30 and three years reigned he in Jerusalem. And he died in a good old age, full of days, riches, and honor. And Solomon his son reigned in his stead. Now the acts of David the king first and last, behold... They're written in the book of Samuel the seer, and in the book of Nathan the prophet, and in the book of Gad the seer. With all his reign and his might, and the times that went over him, and over Israel, and over all the kingdoms of the countries. So, close out uh, First Chronicles with that, and that fits in just pretty much at the end of First Kings chapter 2, and gives us an awful lot more information uh, and detail than kings did. So this is this is what I want to I want to encourage you with tonight, as we as we look at this. Two things. Number one, God chooses, right? Now, in that, I don't think that God says you can be saved and you can't be saved and you can be saved and you can't be saved and you can be saved and you can't be saved. I don't believe God does that. I think it's God's will that all be saved. Uh, matter of fact, I think the Bible is pretty clear in telling us that it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. However. We know that that's not going to happen, unfortunately. But God does very clearly say there is only one way to be saved. And so there's only one God, and His Son is Jesus Christ, and He says you can be saved in Him, through Him, by Him, by His sacrifice on the cross, and that's it. That's the only way. But just like the temple, there's only one temple. There's only one place of worship. 
but it should be a house of prayer to all nations. So anyone, anywhere on the planet could come to that temple and pray to God and offer sacrifice to God in that particular place, right? Now, they, they all couldn't come to the same place. If you're a Gentile, there's only so far you could come, but it was to be a house of prayer for all nations in that particular place. So we see election there. God chooses. God doesn't leave his worship up to the whim of man. God tells them, I'll be worshiped in this way. I'll be worshiped in this place. You'll build it in this way. You'll build it in this, this manner. The second thing that we see is we see a willing heart. And this is what God wants from us in worship. He wants for us to come to him with a willing heart. God is not compulsory. He does not force us to worship him. He does not come and, and whack us in the back of the knees and force us to bow to him. He says, he says I love you. I want you. I will receive you, but you have to come in my way through my son, Jesus. And what he really wants from us is he wants a willing heart, a cheerful, giving, selfless, willing heart to come to him and to say, Lord, I'm yours. I, 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 I want you. I want to worship you. I believe in you. And, and he, he receives us. The heart is where the praise, the generosity, and the faith that's what God is looking for. That's where it starts. It starts in the heart. The plan is made in the heart. I want to give to the Lord. And we see that with David. I want to build this to the Lord. And God's like, that's yeah, a good idea, but you're going to do, you're going to make preparation. Solomon's going to build it. But it starts in the heart. And so I just want to encourage you in that tonight as we, uh, as we think about Jesus and, uh, and the fact that you know, when we take when we take the gospel message, we, we dare not compromise that message. Um, you know, like I said earlier, a Jew can't be saved any other way than coming to to, to God through faith in Jesus Christ. They're going to have to believe in Jesus the only way to be saved. But they can, and so can the person who's raised Muslim or the cultist or the atheist or anybody else. And that gospel message goes out to the entire world. God welcomes any and all that will come to Him and. And, and through his son Jesus in faith. And so we have, we have that message that we can share with the world. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for the evening, and we thank you for your word. And Lord, we, we want to have a, a willing heart as we come to you in worship. And we thank you, Lord, for uh, your incredible um, gift that you've given to us. And Lord, you, you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. And we can come to you through Jesus. Thank you for that, Lord. We ask your blessing on each and every family, Lord, that's our part of our church. For those that can't be here tonight, Lord, we pray you'd bless them. And for, for these folks, Lord, I pray it's been a blessing in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Love you. I'm glad you're here.